Thanks for joining us for another edition of Life Sciences and Biotech CEOs. Today, we have as our guest, John Timberlake, the president and CEO of Berkshire Biomedical. So let me just kind of introduce the product here, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how it came to be. The Berkshire product is designed to provide secure delivery of a prescribed medication, in this case, predominantly liquid medication to an authorized patient with a cloud enabled monitoring system that would ensure patient compliance. That pretty much encapsulates what it is. But one of the co-founders, Tommy Rouse, had a personal experience that caused him to go out at, from a very left field kind of background in finance and that sort of thing, banking, to go out and, and find a way to develop this product. Can you tell us about how it came about and how Tommy personally sort of drove that design? Yeah, it's a good point. So, I, you know, there's, there's really two methods how medical devices, any product probably gets to market. One is some really smart person designs something and then tries to find a market, or there is a unmet need that someone sees, and then they go around and design a product for that market. And that's what happened here. So Tommy Rouse, who was one of the two founders, as you mentioned, he had undergone three consecutive uh, significant spinal surgeries, I think in 2016. Um, he, and the surgeries were good, he had, but he did also, as most people do, you suffer from post-operative pain. Um, and he really got exposed to and, and, and observed and actually witnessed and, and lived the experience of trying to be compliant with medications and especially with you know, pain medications. And um, he basically said there had to be a better way. He said he was a very smart, intelligent person. It was hard to re be, remain compliant. It was hard to keep communication with the doctor. And, and for again, he had no issue with um, the controlled medications, but he saw how people could easily get in trouble with them. So he basically said, once he kind of went through that, he said, there's gotta be a better way. And he brought together another founder, Susan Owen, who's worked with in the past. And the two of them just brainstormed how do we accomplish something? How do we make, make this world better? And they started bringing in people, uh, talented people from the IT world, a good engineer R&D firm. And they came up with various concepts, you know, the earlier concepts, like everything else, you throw the first 10 or 15 out and you keep thinking about it and you get to where we are now with what we call our COPA. Um, and so really, as I mentioned, it's driven based on a personal experience of someone who, who as a human being is always looking to help other people. He's just, he's the salt of the earth type of person. And so he just said, there's gotta be a better way for people. Um, and I'm gonna try to develop something for, for society. But Tommy's not an engineer. Tommy so, is not an engineer whatsoever. So. Susan's not an engineer. None of, them were, neither, none of the core people are engineers. Some of the people they brought in were more IT people. Uh, really, that's why we have really strong cloud-based cybersecurity remote monitoring, which is very important, but they had to seek outside experts in medical device design and technology. Right. And what are there impediments in terms of, I know that uh, patient privacy is so important um, and, and it's been difficult, for example, in a broad kind of macro sense to develop um, a cloud-based system for patient records that right. would go across the system. So are there, are there impediments, are there challenges in terms of um, the cloud and the patient monitoring and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think maybe, um, I think I will come back and maybe describe the product so people kind of put that in context yeah, when you're addressing it. Um, so I think for the audience is what we develop again, we call it COPA, C-O-P-A. It's really a computerized oral prescription administration system. And it's a handheld device, which um, I think we're going to show you, uh, provide a link as part of this uh, um, podcast. But essentially, this handheld uh, drug dispensing device enables a patient to get a drug that's prescribed by their doctor in the exact right amount at the right time, and very importantly, to only that right patient. 
and this is what we call the intended user. So um, your neighbor, your children, no one else can use the drug. Only you can based on biometrics, both of your thumbprint as well as a very neat technology that came up with, which we call dentation, where you basically um, lightly bite on a mouthpiece and it identifies your teeth. And so only you, the patient, when those two match, will get the drug. And the key part that the, the founders brought to this and the team is this remote monitoring communication, because one of the biggest challenges in any drug medication is, is adherence or compliance. And it's twofold. It's, is, is the patient taking the right drug at the right time? But very importantly, does that healthcare provider even know what they're taking so that they can make better decisions? Because there is a, large, a lot of bad healthcare decisions being made because of poor information where doctors have to rely on the patient um, to tell them where they took the dose and therefore the doctor then changes the dose, changes the drug, orders more procedures. That's a huge burden on society as well as the patient. So what Tommy and his team did is they incorporated remote monitoring using cloud-based technology whereby the delivery dispensing device communicates through cellular communication um, to a cloud, a, a HIPAA compliant, cybersecurity compliant cloud, which then can inform the healthcare provider, the doctor, the clinic, or even the, your loved ones, your spouse or your child, whoever, um, of when the, pa when the patient took the dose or if they didn't take the dose. Um, and so to your question on that, the cybersecurity, this is where the core competency of the founders come from, because again, they develop the, all the processing for credit cards in the back office that we all take for granted today and all the security required for that, which is significant, obviously. So this system has been built from the ground up with some very smart IT people um, to be both a HIPAA compliant and very importantly, uh, cyber secure. So for example, the device itself contains no patient information. So if someone for some way were to get the device and try to hack into it, all they get is patient de-identify XYZ 943 takes this drug. They don't know who that patient is. So there's no way to break the patient code. And then the cybersecurity at the cloud level, again, uses, again, security, which I think is probably more intense and tighter than most medical devices, just because of the core competency of the original team. Right. That, in, in fact, just a point. That was kind of Tommy's background. Correct. In finance, right. Was correct. Back office technology and that sort of. Thing. Yeah. All the uh, credit card processing, both for in general process as well as healthcare process, and the records in the background. So he he brought his initial team. He brought in were were people with that experience. And then they augmented that by bringing in, once they had concepts, engineers and, and R&D experts. But the, the, the uniqueness of this, it's not just a drug dispensing device that deliver, you know, delivers a, a X volume, which it does, a very precise and accurate dose. Very importantly, it's leveraging all this technology so that the patient can only get the right dose at the right time and people know about it. And in fact, very important they know when you don't take it and they, the information is as much as they want. The doctor can get, uh, for example, only exception reporting. I only wanna know if the patient doesn't take it. Otherwise I don't wanna hear from you. Or they can look at overall, um, maybe look at a week or a month, what were your compliance? You took it you know, 20 days out of 30. Right. Certain drugs, that's a problem. Other thing, you know, so it's really leveraging that technology to meet that patient need. Where was the product in terms of development when you came in on the scene? Yes, yeah, so I joined about April of 2021. The company had uh, a working device. It was what I would call iteration one. Um, so basically a working device that would deliver liquid drug uh, accurately and precisely. Um, the company, as we talked about, the original intent was to deliver a product mainly control drugs like opioids to patients so that you ensure only that patient gets the product in the right amount. They can't take more drugs than they're supposed to, et cetera. Um, the company um, initially pursued a 510K. I think most people maybe on this podcast don't realize there's probably seven ways to get a device cleared or approved by the FDA. 
the three most common. The most common is called a 510K, which utilizes predicate already approved devices as a comparison. And you use that as a benchmark to say that your device can do the same or similar things. Um, that's the pathway the company originally took. And I thought the argument was sound um, when I joined the company. They were already had submitted done a significant amount of work, had a working product, did all the tests required for 510K. That had been submitted to the FDA. Um, and when, I, when I had joined, um, the FDA had basically just communicated uh, they had some questions around the 510K approach. So one of the very first things I did as CEO was um, bring in um, additional regulatory experts for that very initial meeting with the FDA. And through a very um, open dialogue and, and a cooperative dialogue with the FDA, essentially the FDA said, your device is, has too many unique and differentiating factors and we don't believe there's any predicate already approved device that you can compare to. And therefore, we strongly recommend you pursue what's called a de novo approach. And a de novo, so we, through discussions and meetings, uh, both we agreed with the FDA that the product was unique and differentiated and had a lot of value. Uh, we saw the argument. Um, we also understood the FDA strongly wants us to go that way. Um, the advantage of doing that, because of the de novo, there is no comparison you, the company, have to set your own bars on everything um, from, from delivering security, patient, everything you do, you are setting the bar for that now new product, which means any future people who try to do a predicate on you have to meet your bars. So it's a really good advantage, you know, in hindsight that you have a de novo product because it is uniquely differentiated. So we are pursuing that pathway uh, with the FDA. We've had Great communication with the FDA over the last 14 months on this path. Uh, they have been very cooperative with us. Uh, they encouraged us to have multiple, what is called pre-submission meetings, where you can have very specific topics to have uh, discussion and, more importantly, agreement with the FDA before you submit, which increases your probability of success on submission. So we've had multiple of them. Um, so it's been a very cooperative um, engagement with the FDA. And the FDA actually works with you to set that bar. Though yeah, we, the company has to, company has the burden to set the bar. And the FDA then will review whether that is, did you meet the bar you set and is that appropriate? The value of these, what they're called pre-submission meetings, is it's a very iterative process with the FDA. So you don't just do all this work and submit it like you might do with a 510K, because in that case, the FDA is just reviewing your product versus an already approved product. Here, it's very important to agree up front on protocols, on the bar, the various areas, so that when you submit, the questions the FDA get may be more um, fine-tuning, can you document this, answer this question, versus you should have done X, Y, and Z, which now requires six more months. So it's a, the deniable process is a very iterative and cooperative um, process with FDA. One of the things that that uh, not substantially equivalent finding implies, maybe it more than implies, is that there really isn't any competition for the COVID product. Um, I think we talked about earlier, there are, no one's focused on liquids, um, you know, no one has a bite point, that sort of thing. Um, but tell us about um, sort of what, how you see the market, how you see it um, uh, entering various indications uh, which are already served by someone else, perhaps in a less desirable way. Um, who else is out there and, and what do you see as the market for the product? I think if you, if you look at what our product Copa is trying to do, the combination of you know, accurate dosing of a medication, um, remote monitoring, improvement of compliance and adherence. So there are, are a lot of products and services that focus maybe just on say adherence or compliance. And those can be anywhere from um, apps that can, can help patients and doctors track things to 
um, call centers and service centers with nursing staff or, or pharmacy staff, and all of them have value. All of them are helping to improve compliance and adherence. And then when you look at the technology side, there are a, quite a few products out there who have tried to improve, um, say, that's called compliance from a physical point of view. Um, I'll call I'll, for a generic term, I'll use a pill box or a pill. You know, we all know these little things you can buy at a pharmacy that you can put your pills in every day and manually do it. Right. Um, and those are challenging for all of us, um, especially any of us who have loved ones and uh, parents. Um, for myself, I have a hard time keeping track of anything I need to do. So there are technologies out there that have, which have automated that process where thereby you can get a, I'll call it a device or machine at home that will dispense the pills you need for that day, for example. Um, and that is a great improvement to help patient care. So now they can have that in their services tied to pharmacies and distributions to do that. What we do that's unique to each of these individually is uh, what we're trying to do is not only make sure that the patient takes, you know, the right medicine, but they take it at the right time and, the, and, the only the, and very importantly, only the right person takes it. And no one else can, actually can do all three of those things. Um, we focus on liquids because it's really the only way to ensure the patient gets the drug into their mouth. So with these pill devices we've talked about, there are great technologies out there that prove that, hey, my mom took her medicines out of the box and only my mom took it out. You can actually prove that. You can actually have a device that says, my mom, based on a password or a fingerprint, is the only one that can get the pills out of that box. Now, did my mom swallow the pills? Did she take the pills? Did somebody else take them? Most devices can't handle that. There are some under development using video, for example, where you Theoretically, the patient takes the pill out of the box with their thumbprint or his code, and then they videotape taking the pill in their mouth. Again, that probably is fine for many products. But again, but if you're looking at not for, mom. not for mom or not for for sure controlled drugs and opioids, um, where uh, very, you know, unfortunately, people would put that under their tongue and then show the video. And then when the video is off, they take it out of their mouth and either misuse it, abuse it, et cetera. So we're really the only one to, to my knowledge that is really doing all of them. The advantage of liquids also, as we talk to physicians, many drugs, especially opioids and controlled pain medications, um, the dosing is, is when you use pills or tablets are in increments of milligrams and they're not necessarily fine tuned as well as the doctor wants them to be but you have issues asking patients to break pills in half, especially older patients. You have issue with you give them a bottle of, of liquid and tell them to measure three mils because the average person over 30 or 40 can't differentiate you know, three mils from four mils in a, in a cup sometimes. I know I can't anymore. So you have a big challenge. So the doctors love the fact of using a liquid because now they can dose in fact, our product can dose in 0.25 mill, uh, millivier increments. So very fine tuning. So very important for pain. Um, so the liquid provides advantage of good fine tuning for the physicians, our device, because it is delivered into the mouth only by that patient. Um, it can't be used by another patient. So we're trying to marry, again, back to my initial point, the product was designed first by understanding there is a need and what's missing and now design the product versus have a product and try to, what I say, shove it down some patient because we designed this full product with bells and whistles. Now I need to sell it. That's not the way the company did it. So one of the things that's interesting to me personally, because I have a, a family issue that I've had with it, is the whole opioid crisis situation. 100,000 people died in the United States last year as a result of opioids. And one of the difficulties in treating opioids is that um, there are particular licenses and trainings that doctors have to have in order to um, practice and, and making the prescriptions uh, for the various products which would be a substitute. 
but this is a way potentially for those physicians to treat more patients, a lot more patients. So I guess let's talk a little bit about that and then some more about the FDA because 100,000 people died last year. So we need to get this out there as quickly as we can. Agreed. So I think, as you mentioned, um, I think we all know you can't, you can't live on this planet and not realize we have a serious epidemic, um, you know, opioid epidemic in this country, and it's, and it's stemmed over the years. Um, and what that led to was, you know, prop, you know, I'll say proper that needed to be addressed. But as most things happen in life, pendulum swing, extremes left and extreme right. And by trying to do the right thing, um, it became really hard for doctors and patients who had legitimate needs for pain medications to get them. And with all the burden, burdensome protocols and steps that were put in place, um, many doctors stopped using them. Many patients didn't want to use them. And so you have a lot of patients who are suffering chronic pain, for example, who cannot get them um, properly. That's also, by the way, well documented has led to a higher, higher use of illicit drugs. We all know fentanyl has been a, is now a huge problem in this country that crosses our borders every day. So when someone can't get a legitimate prescribed product by their physician for, for legitimate need, they have, sometimes will resort to illicit products. So we believe there's a huge need to help patients who there is a good legitimate reason to be using a controlled drug like an opioid under physician supervision. And as you were kind of discussing, there's a whole separate need of patients who are already addicted to opioids and not even opioids, all kinds of illicit products and drugs. There are millions of patients who are already addicted and who want to seek treatment. And those are extreme high barriers for physicians and clinics to treat those patients. So there are really two different ways that we can talk about it. I'll kind of let you decide, you know, which way, which approach do you want to talk about first? Well, first, let's talk about those who require the opioids, like mom, yeah. okay, because they have some chronic pain or something like that, um, that really necessitates that they have them. Now, yeah. I can know, I, I know from personal experience with my mother that she's had, she's 85, and has had difficulties several times in terms of keeping track of her pills and taking them at the prescribed time and not taking too many of them um, because she forgot that she took one an hour ago um, or whatever the case may be. So let's talk about them first. Yeah, I think that's what we mentioned. So that's a great point. So there are, I think, um anywhere from 75 million plus Americans that are using opioids at some level. When you focus on chronic use, there's about 15 million patients. And again, they were people who might've had, you know, a bad back issue surgery where they're at the point where surgery is just no longer an option. So they're gonna be on pain medication the rest of their life um, or other issues that, you know, um, for the next five or 10 years, they're gonna be on opioids. Those are the patients where there's a big need to help them control and use the product appropriately. Um, and as you mentioned, your own mother, um, and for almost anybody, it is hard to um, always take the right medicine at the right time, the right amount. And when you're giving uh, that patient, especially when you're talking to people and their seniors, um, keeping track of that is very hard. So what we hope with our product to do is with all the features we talked about is if a patient needs to be taking a certain dose, say twice a day at a certain amount, our device will allow them to take it only at those time, time windows and only the exact amount the doctor wants. But it has the ability to be changed. So if over time the doctor says the dose needs to be different based on patient feedback, they can through their pharmacy can remotely change that dose. Only the pharmacy can change the dose on the device. The doctor can prescribe a different dose, but they can't change the device. So you basically have the ability with patients to make sure, very importantly, maybe I'll back up. You know, we hear about the opioid addiction problem and probably most people who haven't experienced it, it's kind of the blame game. It's like, you know, people, it's their fault. They did it, right? Their people are trying to misuse these and abuse them. 
in many cases, it's not that they're trying to, they just take, they have pain, they take more dose than they should be, and they become addicted, not by ill will or intel. It just happens um, in that drug with those type of drugs. So what our device is designed to do is, you know, even before they're in chronic pain is hopefully get someone who never gets addicted because they can't take more dose than they're supposed to. They can't take dosages their doctor doesn't know they're taking. Um, and if they seek a dose outside their windows, even the device can tell the doctor that. So they can say, John, you're supposed to take this twice a day. You're trying to take this every two hours. What's going on here? So you maybe have legitimate pain needs. Well, let's come back in and talk. You know, I want to see you, you know, versus a patient taking a, a 30 day supply of drugs and using it all in one week. And the doctor finds out after the fact. So there are so many values in the, you know, treating people who have legitimate needs, uh, whether it's chronic or post-operative, um, you know, sometimes it's persistent post-operative. So maybe not that first three days, but it's a knee surgery and it's happening over months, not just, you know, post three days after a surgery. So we're looking at that most, you know, the persistent post-op and chronic as the first entry point in the pain area, just because those patients have need for this product um, and they're already on it in most cases. And we want to try to make sure that they're getting the right dose at the right time and, just, and that the healthcare provider knows that, right. knows when they're getting it. I'm standing today because I've had a pretty serious back issue now for over a month. And it's really the first time I've ever experienced severe pain. And I've learned something from it, which is that when you are always in pain, with the best good faith efforts, your mind is not what it is when you're not in pain. No matter what your age or your you know, abilities might be. And so it, it really brings to mind for me um, the need for something like this for someone who um, isn't experienced with pain and doesn't know what to, what to expect in terms of maybe like Tommy, um, dosing himself and keeping track of it and all that sort of thing. It, pain does funny things to your memory that are not good. No, I think that you add on top of that, your experience of, and, and patients are not pharmacists. So my reason I say that is you're someone who's in pain you have extreme pain, so you want to take some pain medication. 15 minutes later, you may still be in pain and think you need to take more, but you don't really understand that drug you're taking you might have a 30 minute time period and onset of action. So now you've taken more dose, not out of ill will or intent, but you just don't realize you just need to give it another. So our technology will make that impossible and prohibit them from you know, taking that dose 15 minutes later, the device won't allow it. Now, again, if they need it and there's pain, they can call their doctor and say, you know, I need more dose than you. But that's a discussion that's not happening today. You know, they're just, patients are making those decisions uh, many, many times it's just because they're in pain. They're not, I want to get, right. nothing else matters right now. I need to, I need to address the pain. And I think that, that that back and forth in terms of monitoring with the physician helps him or her ultimately have a more, realistic conversation with the patient about what their experience is as a result of taking, or in some cases, not taking the drug. Um, it's no longer, well, you're just not taking it properly or something like that. He knows, he or she knows exactly when it's being taken and how much is being taken. And then can just get a reflection from the patient about what their response is to whatever it is they take. Um, exactly, exactly. To me, it's all, it's all about help, helping healthcare professionals make what I call informed decisions. Um, whether it's pain medicine or any medicine is if you have to rely on completely unknowing what, what the patient took it, or in the case that they take it at the right time and the right dose. Like I mentioned earlier, there is literally billions of dollars spent in, this, in, our, in our healthcare system by changing drugs that you didn't need to change or changing the dose or ordering procedures because something is not working in the doctor's mind when the reality is 
the patient wasn't even taking it. So you don't know if it was working or not. Right. So let's, let's go back now and talk for a minute about um, something that excites me, which is how it helps um, or can help physicians in addiction clinics and that sort of thing help more people because there really are a shortage of those kinds of physicians and people aren't getting the help they need when this product can really help broaden uh, the, the level of um, availability. I think you're quite right. I think this is one of the most um, important things that this product can really help address immediately. So um, there are literally millions and millions of patients who are addicted to some form of drug. Um, about 2 million of those patients seek treatment. So they actively work hard to seek treatment to overcome their addiction. And what that requires today for most patients is a combination of, of both counseling and psychology, um, as well as in many cases, drug um, assistive, they call drug assistive therapy. So it's, you know, you, it may seem strange, um, but if you're addicted to opioids and drugs, a very common and most effective way to, to treat them in addition to counseling is to actually give them another opioid under a well-controlled monitored situation. So what you're basically doing is eliminating the physical cravings and the psychological cravings, starting with the physical cravings by the receptors to want more pain medicine, more drugs, more opioids or illegal drugs. So what happens in this country are, are these patients who are seeking that treatment have to go to a, a clinic that is approved both by the federal government and the state governments to treat opioid use disorder or drug addiction. Um, so we have several constraints here. We have constraints on hand. Uh, um, there are never enough clinics to treat every patient who desires help especially in rural America, which is, you know, a huge percent of our population. In fact, a big problem percentage of the people who are addicted. So you have, don't have enough clinics to treat the patients. Also, what's very important is, as I mentioned, these drugs that you take to help treat your addiction must be taken every day and they must be taken in the right amount at the right time. Otherwise, it defeats the whole purpose of the treatment process. So, the drugs that we are focused on for our product is one of the most common used for, a treat, for opioid use disorder, and, and that's a drug called methadone. And it's pre predominantly delivered at clinics in a liquid form. And so what happens for the vast majority of patients, they're required to go in to physically transport themselves one way or another into a clinic every day, six days a week, um, and to take a dose under supervision. And they do that because these patients as a general population are at high risk for abuse, misuse, diversion, selling the product. So under all the guidelines, you have to meet a, many guidelines before you're allowed to take these drugs on your own at home. And you always start by going to clinics. So we have a, so a general way these patients are treated. They go to this clinic every day. They wait in line. They then are given their drug, they take under a uh, physical supervision of someone to make sure they took it and swallowed it. And that's all recorded, videotape, everything is tricked. And then the patient leaves and comes back the next day. So if you are a patient who is, again, these are patients who want to do something about their addiction. They're making this huge effort to come every day. They're spending out of pocket money every day for transportation to get to clinics. Sometimes it could be hours away for them. Now they're trying to hold down a job, making it tough because maybe they're working and they've got to be at work at 7 a.m. while well, the clinic doesn't even open to 7. So now holding a job can be difficult. Um, so it's a huge burden on them and a cost to the system. So I'll kind of talk about the description first of all before I talk about the product. Pa there are a percentage of patients, and it was about 20% of patients who earn the right to take what's called take-home therapy. So in other words, they are allowed to take a certain amount of, of this controlled drug home under a lockbox and take the medication every day on their own. Um, they are subject to drug tests and screening and all kinds of other things to make sure we try to track them. But as we talked about earlier, 
if a patient goes home with a, a, a lockbox with six bottles of drug because they don't want the patient measuring, so it has to be individual dose measured bottles, and the patient is supposed to take that thing every day around 7 or 8 a.m., the doctor or the clinic will not know that they took all six of them once a, one, one a day or they took all six one day or if they sold them until they come back six days later and are tested. And by then, their treatment has to be restarted based on the physical, physical features and the whole physiology of the addiction. So it is a really a, a, a kind of a Band-Aid approach to try to control uh, the use of the product and get people away. So what we intend with our product and based on research with clinics and physicians who treat patients is to do two things. One is to enable more patients to improve their quality of life, hold down a job and get back in society by only maybe coming to the clinic one day a week, or one day every two weeks, because they, they can now go home with a week or two week supply with our device. And it can only be delivered, you know, at the time clinic says so, that's once or twice a day in the right amount. If the patient were to take a hammer and break the device open, um, they can do that and sip up the drug for one day, for example, or someone else could. Um, but then that next day's dose cannot be delivered. The clinic will know that immediately that, that Tuesday's dose was not taken. They will call the patient and say, you need to come back into the clinic and bring the device. The patient obviously can't present the device. They will then be, they will lose their take home privileges. So there's a, it's a way where you can't prevent a single use or a diversion, but you can protect chronic multiple use of it. So huge benefit for the patient, right? Now I can actually hold down a job. I can function. Huge, huge benefit to the clinic because if I have a staff and an infrastructure and I can support 100 patients who are coming in every day and they have to come in every day, I'm supporting hundred patients. If they can come in once a week, I can support 500 patients, same resources. So now I can dramatically serve my community and serve more patients with the same resources. Right. You said two things that are really powerful there um, that I, I realized from personal experience with my son. One is you can't sell the methadone now. So there's this huge underground market for all of these uh, uh, curative, that's not the proper phrase, but, but um, other drugs like methadone and suboxone and that sort of thing. You won't be able to sell it and take the money and go buy the opiate that you really want. And then the other thing is you're able to hold down a job. You're able to hold down a job. My son experienced the same sort of thing in going every day. And as a result of that, he lost his job. Came home to me, sobbed on my couch for three hours and was never recoverable after that. He lost any sort of goal. They need to be able to have a job and a purpose beyond I'm here to take drugs. And I see that as, as really the greatest benefit of the product. I believe that had my son been able to keep that job, he might be alive today. And so it, it, from personal experience, I think it's the greatest contribution um, that the COPA may end up making um, to, to the op opioid uh, epidemic. So I'm really excited about the, uh, the possibilities for the product. Um, I hope that uh, sometime soon we'll read um, in endpoints or someplace else that the product's been um, given approval by the FDA and, and that we'll begin to see it out there in the market um, because I think it has uh, a great potential to benefit um, not only um, those who, who require the op opiates uh, um, for chronic pain like my mother, but also for those um, 
who require um, an anecdote, in a sense, to that, uh, that opioid experience. So it was very uh, just terrific to have you, John. Um, I'm really excited about the prospects for, the, for uh, Berkshire, and I'm sure you are as well. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, following your progress in the future. Tim, I appreciate that. And I probably should have started off. I just want to make it clear that you kind of stated there, but we have yet, we have not submitted our device to the FDA and therefore it is not available for commercial use. So right. I just want to make sure that I state that. And, and Tim, I appreciate your stories because uh, for reasons of your, your son and your mother is why I got into healthcare and the pharmaceutical and devices and why I'm, why I believe this product, you know, every day is a hard day at work. Every day you have challenges and frustrations, but to know that, you know, could I have saved your son drives me more than anything. You know, that's why I do what I do is I can make an impact and not a person's lives, but people's lives. Someone else. Exactly. Let's, so thank let's you. So. All right, John. Well, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you.